I'll do I have a seat again. And as I've indicated, it is a, a very real pleasure to be able to welcome among us as our main speaker over these days, Kevin D. Young from Christ Covenant Church in uh, Matthews, North Carolina. Uh, delighted to have Kevin with us and his PA, Barry Peterson, uh, who has been not just a PA, but his friend for an even longer period of time. And the two of them are a reminder to us of the, the bonds of brotherly love, uh, the mutual support, encouragement, and help that is given expression in all sorts of practical ways. And I hope you'll take the opportunity to meet them as well as uh, listen to and soak in the ministry of Kevin himself. Uh, as minister of Gilcomson Church, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Kevin insofar as um, one of uh, the men whom we, we regard as very much uh, part and parcel of Gilcomson, Ben Trainham. Uh, he's been out in uh, America benefiting from uh, the, the ministry out there under Kevin DeYoung over the past number of years. And delighted that Ben is back in Scotland and that we're able to look forward to his ministry here in Scotland and to have that added connection uh, in that way. Um, <clears throat> Kevin was due to have been here a couple of years back, as you may recall, um, and had to call off at the last minute on account of COVID, uh, as uh, many of our arrangements got uh, slightly altered in the process. Uh, and we are, are thrilled to bits, Kevin, that you've been able and willing to uh, come this year as well and share with us. Um, it's a, a very heavy week for him. He goes on from here to Aberdeen to lead a day conference, four separate sessions uh, on what is, bracket still, the mission of the church. And uh, so we want to pray for him that the Lord would sustain him and uh, indeed refresh and encourage him and Barry through the time that we share together. So let's, uh, let's pray for Kevin and then Kevin will be glad to hand over to you. Our gracious God and Father, as we gather here, we do so conscious of your own sovereign providences and thank you that at this particular juncture, we are able to gather and together learn from your word through the ministry of Kevin. Thank you for your safekeeping of him and Barry as they've traveled across on the back of a conference last weekend as well. Busy, demanding time. And we look forward, living God, to hearing your word as by your own Holy Spirit you are pleased to open it and apply it to us. We never cease to marvel at that great mystery whereby your word first breathed out by the power of your Holy Spirit so long ago is to this day nothing less than the word of God invested with that remarkable life-giving and life-changing power that secures growth. And our prayer, living God, is that you would so minister among us through these days, through your word, by your spirit, that there may be that growth effected in our hearts, in our affections, in our ministries, that will simply redound to your praise and glory, that will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, that will find our hearts drawn out to him with an ever-deepening love and with an ever-deepening fervor and an ever-deepening confidence and desire to proclaim the many-faceted glories of your word and all to the praise of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray, please, our Father, that by your Holy Spirit you would indeed so anoint Kevin himself through these days that he may be conscious even as he ministers your word that it's not him that's ministering it. That he himself may be blessed through that ministry of your Holy Spirit through him. 
and that he would indeed be strengthened and sustained and invigorated in such a manner that he will indeed be used powerfully by you to shape our thinking, to correct us, to rebuke us, to uh, inspire in us that manner of ministry that will bear its own fruit in days to come, that we may indeed be and become ever more courageous in this age that is ever more idolatrous, and all for the glory of your own great name. Come upon us, Lord, we pray you and bless and use Kevin now, we pray, as we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. 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 Well, Kevin, we are delighted to welcome you. Thank a you. Warm Scottish welcome to you. Yes, and we look forward you. to your ministry. Very wonderful to be with you. I've been, I've spoken and attended lots of conferences all around the world. It's the first time that the conference gathering space has a pipe organ. So this <laughs> is right and proper way to do it in Scotland. In fact, uh, we're going to be studying in these sessions. Exodus 32, you'll know, is the sin of the golden calf. They seem a little strange. What, what can we do to encourage ministers? Well, one, let's get together in January when it's dark, and let's look at a text of sin and rebellion. And hopefully you'll find that it's more than just that and will be encouraging to us. Thank you for the books, and uh, be glad to know that Douglas Kelly is still doing well, and uh, we actually are in the same presbytery, and I have, although I didn't have the privilege of having him as a, as a student, as many of my friends did, he still is uh, teaching in various ways and has some wonderful, what should I say, eccentricities. One of them is he's, he's quite known in presbytery meetings. He's the only one who can get away with this. As we're examining a student, he will be seated in his chair, take off his shoes with just his socks, put them up on the table or the chair, and in his Carolina sort of bro say, brother, tell me about the double procession of the Holy Spirit. And just ask in, in its very uh, intimidating way. You'll see that I have uh, paisley socks that I picked out of the drawer just for all of you. I did my, my doctoral studies on John Witherspoon, Scottish pastor in uh, Paisley and in Beeth before immigrating to the United States where he was one of the leaders in a little revolution that we had there. <laughs> so don't hold that against us. I find, sadly, that now I'm sure in this august group you all know who John Witherspoon is, but even in Scotland, if I mention it, the first sort of question, well now I just tell people, not the guy who invented the pubs, different weather school. <laughs> it's not him, but a, a very fine Scottish, Church of Scotland of course at the time, minister who then left his mark in a profound way in America. So in his honor, I have the Paisley socks. We are going to look in these four sessions in Exodus 32, so please do turn in your Bible. In this afternoon, we'll be looking at the first six verses. Be reading from the ESV, the elect standard version, <laughs> uh, beginning at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up 
to play. I know I'm speaking to many pastors and preachers, not all of you, and glad to have wives and other trainees and others with us. But as I think about preparing a sermon each week, one of the things I remember from seminary that has always stuck with me and and has been helpful from week to week is to distinguish between the exegetical main point and the homiletical main point. They're sometimes identical, but they're not always identical. That is to say, when I find my mind, as you've been trained to do as, as preachers, to be reading a text and you start thinking, what, what's going to preach here? What do I want to say? I need to slow down and say, well, before I get to that, what is this about in its own context? So that's the exegetical point. What are these verses doing in this chapter, in this book, in this scope of redemptive history? And then when you've answered that question, you can go to think about the homiletical point. Sometimes preachers skip that first point, and so their sermons can be a bit thin. But other times, I know this is my tendency, I just stay there at the exegetical main point without thinking, well then, what is it in particular from this that God wants to say to his people? So sometimes they're the same, but sometimes they're not. Now, this is one of those passages where, thankfully, we have an inspired commentary which tells us what at least the main homiletical point should be from this text. So if I'm thinking at first exegetically what's going on here, if you know the book of Exodus, you know you have the story of the plagues and all those famous bits in leading out of Egypt, And then right there in the middle of the 40 chapters, chapter 20 are the Ten Commandments, some other rules. And then we have the instructions for the tabernacle. If we're honest, it strikes us as rather dull and boring. We think, why would a great majority or plurality of this book be taken up first with instructions for building the tabernacle and then sometimes repeated word for word with the actual building of those things in the second half. And in the middle there, instructions for the tabernacle, the actual building of the tabernacle, you have this rebellion in chapter 32, and then God speaking to Moses in 33 and 34, and then they enter again into how they are to build this place. Well, think about it. Even though it seems sort of strange to us, if, if someone, if the Lord himself were giving you your church, you would write down very carefully, now where does it go? Which way does it face? How do we put it together? And not only if it was the church where you worship, but it was the church where sacrifices took place and the place that would symbolically represent the very dwelling place of God. You would take careful note. And every bit of it, as you had to construct it, would be entering into your mind. So that's what's happened here exegetically. Build the tabernacle like this. Then they'll build it. And in the middle, this rebellion, which invites the question, well, will they get there? That is, will God dwell with them? Because that's the point of the tabernacle and later the point of the temple. That the Ark of the Covenant there in the Holy of Holies was to represent God himself dwelt in the midst of the camp. It's the Emmanuel principle shot throughout the whole Bible. God with us. And interrupting this promise of God with us is the sin of the golden calf. And it's here as a warning. Now why do we know that? Well, if you keep your finger there, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So I said we have an inspired commentary that tells us what is the homiletical main point. Lest we get lost in just understanding what happened and is the, what is the Egyptian bull god, and we'll talk about some of that, and we miss the forest for the trees. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, And all were baptized into Moses. There you see, incidentally, that 
to be baptized is first of all an expression of union. That it, it can't mean in every instance a physical immersion because they were not physically swallowed up in Moses. Now the Baptists are wondering, why am I here? Uh, <laughs> continuing on, we're glad you're here. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. Do you see the beginning, uh, a, a precursor, a type of the sacrament? Baptism, and a supper, a meal, a drink. For they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them. The rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Incidentally, verse 4 there is one of the reasons I take a somewhat minority view when Jesus says in Matthew 16, upon this rock I will build my church. And of course we disagree with the Catholic interpretation that thinks it's built upon Peter as the first bishop of Rome of some kind, uh, but rather upon Peter's confession. I actually think it's upon the one whom Peter confessed, that that is the rock. Wherever rock is used in the New Testament, it's used with reference to Christ. Uh, if you don't agree with that interpretation, take it up with Turretin, because he says the same thing. Now, these things took place. So here's where we get to our golden calf story. As an example for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. And here's a quote from the passage we just read. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Notice again. Paul understands that in putting God to the test, they were putting Christ to the test, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. I know there is an aversion in some Reformed circles to preaching sermons that are overly hortatory that is that say here's an example be like this here's a ex bad example don't be like that and i grant that sort of preaching can be moralistic but it need not be in fact we have scriptural warrant here that sometimes a good sermon takes a portion of scripture and says this is an example that's a warning don't be like them now, of course, Paul doesn't leave it at a moralistic lesson. It's all shot through with, with Christ imagery and redemptive historical sweep. But at least part of what we're meant to see in Exodus 32 is that this is a lesson for us. And as we think about pastors and ministry leaders, first for our own hearts, but then communicating to others what sort of lessons we might see. And this first one in our first session I want us to think about is, as the title says in your program, the exceeding forgetfulness of sin. It's very much borrowing from the Puritans. Samuel Bolton had a book, The Greatest Evil, Sin. The Mischief of Sin by Thomas Watson. And then the exceeding sinfulness of sin by Jeremiah Burroughs. So borrowing from the Puritans, I've called this the exceeding forgetfulness of sin. Because as we'll see in this text, at the heart of their rebellion is that they have not remembered who God is and what he has done for them. And part of what we need in our own Christian lives and, and, and men, what we need to do in ministry is we are called... Though our world does not like it, we are called to show forth the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The Bible has hard words and hard language to describe sin. Because I have a, a big family, I have nine kids. One wife, nine kids. It equals ten. Lots of people say, why don't you just round it off and have ten? <coughs> Well, why don't you do it? 
We're at nine. So we have, we have nine kids, and because of that, we have a lot of trash, garbage, rubbish. And so we have uh, a big trash bin, we say, and you have to wheel it out to the corner for the trash man to pick it up. I've often thought, if, if Bunyan were writing Pilgrim's Progress today, he would use the image of the trash collector. You know, he talks about the burden of sin falling off his back. I think there's all of our garbage, our rubbish. A nice man in a big truck just every week just dumps it and takes it away. It's a picture. Feel free to use it. It's a picture of our sins being carried off. But because we have so many of us, we fill that up. And uh, sometimes pastor privilege, I, I haul off some of the bags and I throw them into the dumpster at church. And sometimes if people who are, don't know that I'm you know, from the community are like, can we do that? Can we just bring, no, I'm, I'm the pastor. I, pastor privilege, I throw my trash away here. Well, I mentioned that in a sermon and a nice couple from our church said, oh, pastor, we hear you don't have enough, you have too much trash. We've ordered you another trash bin another big wheel so now it's nice and then when we have to do the recycling sometimes we have as many as five of these things out all at once so we got a a, a brand new green shiny trash bin oh, it just sparkled there in the sunlight um you can google it later the sun comes out in other parts of the country <laughs> world and it's really nice and there it was but you know what's it so it looks very nice you know what's inside of it especially in a hot summer day in Charlotte. It's disgusting. Uh, I won't paint too much of a picture, but you open up and you see what looks like little white rice, but it's not rice. It's little maggots, and it stinks. And we have two cats for some reason. I don't know why. And so sometimes we have to bag up the cat and put the cat stuff in there. It's gross. Outside, shiny, new wonderful. Don't open it up. Part of what scripture does for us, if we're dealing honestly, this is, I know you look shiny. Open up the top of that rubbish bin and you'll see what sin is really like. And that's part of what we're called to do as ministers. Then apply the gospel, of course, but expose to see because it's not enough. God knows us better than we know ourselves. It's not enough to just say, you sin, stop sinning. We need motivation. And one of the motivations is to see it and, and to look at it and realize how ugly and vile and sinful this sin is. So what I want you to see from this text in our time here, five characteristics about sin, five reasons sin is so sinful and evil and ugly. And that may not sound like good news, but remember what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 10. This is a warning to us, and we will not be warned unless we, we feel something of the heinousness of their rebellion. And so we say, oh, Lord, keep us from the same. Number one, sin disobeys the word of God. Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is sin? Anyone know? Hear, hear, that's right. Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the word of God. And the verse, 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. Sin is known by many different words in Hebrew and Greek, but simplest, it is a transgression of the law. Any want of conformity unto or transgression of God's word. Think about the sin with the golden cap. They broke the first commandment. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And what do we read in verse 1? They say, up, make us gods who shall go before us. They broke the first commandment. They broke the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of thing in the heaven above or the earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. And what do we read in verse 4? He fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. A direct violation of the second commandment. They thought they could worship the Lord the way they wanted to 
and the Lord would be pleased. So if we wanted another sermon, we could have a fine message here about the regulative principle in worship. Sometimes that gets used in ways to just fight with one another, but at its heart, it's this principle here we find in God's word that God himself determines the acceptable way to worship him. But look what they say in verse 5. This is very curious. Aaron saw this, built an altar. Tomorrow shall be a feast day to the Lord. Now you're looking in your Bible, you know that when Lord is given in that small uppercase script, it's translating the word Yahweh or Jehovah. It's the covenant divine name, Lord. So he, he, Aaron thinks, I can make, we can make this calf. We're going to do sacrifices. We're going to do a burnt offering. You've just given us instructions for that. And we'll call it, they didn't say a feast day to Baal or to Apsis probably the the god that they're mimicking here from the egyptians no they said this is a feast day to yahweh they thought in their hearts we are serving our covenant god but it wasn't pleasing to god whatever words they said whatever they may have intended this was not the way in which god had determined to be worshiped just because we or our people think that we are sincerely directing our worship to God does not mean he receives it as true worship. It's very hard, especially for younger generations, and younger is always people younger than me, so there's getting more and more younger generations all the time. That we we tend to think sincerity is the measure of worship. Well, but he means well, she means well. Uh, They're really nice people. They're doing the best they can. They're sincere. Well, Aaron may have sincerely thought this will be a feast day. Oh, Yahweh, who delivered us from Egypt, we dedicate this to you. But God did not receive it as true worship. They broke the first commandment, the second commandment, the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And look at verse 4. They said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Blasphemy. There in this golden calf, they say, that is a symbol of Yahweh himself, the God who delivered us from Egypt. They took his name in vain. Aaron, in fact, had baptized this blasphemy. We get a a picture in verse 1. It's not a very good picture of Aaron. He's... He's depicted here not so much as someone who woke up and decided that he wanted to lead God's people into idolatry, but someone who simply didn't have the backbone to say enough. And isn't that often the case? It's not so much that ministers or professing Christians who go awry think, I'm going to lead God's people into idolatry today. But look what happens to him. The people saw that Moses delayed. The people gathered themselves together to Aaron. You ever had that? A bunch of people ganging up on you, gathering themselves to Aaron, 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 knocking on his door or pulling on his tent. Where's your brother at? Thought he was supposed to be leading us. We don't know where he is. What's happening here? And Aaron, weak-willed, a bit spineless, baptizes their blasphemy, allows it to go forward. They broke the seventh commandment. You say, well, I see one, two, and three, a seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. But surely that's what is meant at the end of verse six. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You might think, well, that's very nice. At least they did something helpful that day. They had a bit of fun, and they, maybe they played with their kids. But certainly that's not what the word play means here. If you remember 1 Corinthians 10 that I read a few moments ago, immediately after talking about the sin of the golden calf, it goes on to the sin of sexual immorality. And that's in the time of 
Balaam, but there's a connection between the two. It says, verse 25, that Aaron let the people break loose. So it's hard to imagine they engaged in pagan worship of a pagan god. It's hard to imagine they did that without also cavorting like pagans, because that's what the pagans did when they had their celebration of their gods. It was a time of sexual immorality. Their disobedience is all the more striking because of what is going on up on Mount Sinai at the same time. This is sort of a, if you're ever watching a, a show and it'll say, meanwhile, well, this dramatic thing is happening. Well, well, meanwhile, verse one, the people saw that Moses was delayed. Well, what's he delayed with? Everything in those previous chapters, namely on Mount Sinai, receiving the instructions for worship and the tabernacle and the offerings and the base, receiving this instruction, how to worship God, they are worshiping God in the most idolatrous way possible. Moses is also receiving instructions concerning the priesthood. And here you have Aaron, the priest, who is leading the people into all manner of sin. God is telling Moses how the people are to worship him, while the Israelites, led by the man who will soon be their high priest, are breaking every instruction related to worship. It's all the more striking when you think about the juxtaposition of Aaron here with the people on earth and Moses up on the mountain in the heavens, as it were, receiving the divine instruction. One of the reasons I'm glad I'm a minister well, let me back up and put the, I'll put the negative in the positive. One of the things that frightens me as a minister is I know, may the Lord spare us all from egregious, disqualifying sin, but I know should I sin in such a way, as a public person, it can't help but be a public effacing of God and his church. Of course, there is forgiveness. We know that, and you know men, and perhaps even here we've had to receive forgiveness for those sorts of sins. Praise God for the gospel. But it does, it does give me pause as a minister, and particularly the more that God may, may, opportunities he may give to you, I sometimes think if a lot of people, not least of which my children and my wife and a congregation and now serving people like you, a lot of people, they're not counting on me to save them. They're not counting on me to be perfect. But they are, in a way, counting on me not to make shipwreck of my faith, to, to live a life above reproach. That, that's the warning. The positive is, I do think, I'm sure some of you men can experience this, that I, the Lord can use that to keep us out of sin. I mean, there are times when uh, you know, I'll think if I'm, if I'm tempted to take a second glance in a direction of, that I shouldn't look or, or, or nurture a thought or an image that I, that I shouldn't, the Lord will often be very good to bring to mind, Kevin, you, but you're a pastor. Now, it should be enough to say you're my child, you're a Christian. Yes, that's true. But there is, a, there is a calling and there is an office and an ordination and the Lord has often brought that to mind. Yes, Lord. There is an even higher calling that I have. So, so set me free and thank you, Lord, for remembering, helping me to remember who, who I am. Aaron forgot who he was. And the juxtaposition between him and, and his brother could not be starker in this moment. They disobeyed the word of God. Now, I promise, that was the, the, they'll get shorter. That's the old pastor trick. And just hang on, hang on. But number two, so sin disobeys the word of God. Sin rejects the character of God. That's number two. The golden calf 
episode is a repudiation of who God is as God. Think of what God had already told them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. This cow did not bring you out of Egypt. I am a jealous God. I am not going to look on this treachery lightly. Or on the mountain, remember, it says they heard his voice and they saw no form. I am an invisible God and here you have represented me with visible things. So it's not only that sin breaks a law, it does, but it also repudiates the lawgiver. If, if I give instructions to one of my children, now I love my kids, they're good kids, but there, there's a good chance that they, how shall I say, they will not respond with prompt, cheerful obedience. Maybe the kids are much better here in Scotland than in the rebellious American colonies, but that's how it goes. And they may like to just say, well, Dad, it's just your rules. You have all of these rules. And I love you, Daddy. I just, I'm tired of these rules. Okay, it's not you. It's just your rules. Well, if, if they come downstairs on a Saturday morning with, with chores to do, in a handwritten note. Who, who wrote the note? The rules did not just come by spontaneous generation. Someone lovingly, wisely penned those rules. You cannot crumple up the rules and throw them away without something of a rejection of the very one who gave you those laws. So it's not just, well, I broke a law. You Christians are always about laws, laws, laws. A loving, kind, merciful, good God gave you these laws. And in rejecting those laws, they rejected God, the character of God. See, at their heart, they didn't like the sort of God that God is. They may have fancied to themselves, well, we're just being uh, creative. But in their hearts, they, they're, they're saying, God, I wish we could see you. God, I wish you were like the other gods around us. You don't make much sense. The gods around us, they, all of our neighbors, they can see their God. They have a statue for their God. They can bow down to a physical God. Why can't you be like the other gods? And the Lord says, you think this cow delivered you from Egypt? What's worse? If someone says to you, I hate you. Now again, sometimes my, my younger kids, little ones, and they get frustrated and upset, and, and they, they will in a moment of anger. I, said, I hate you know, whatever brother or sister. I won't give the name. but And sometimes they've even said, four-year-old, I hate you, mommy or daddy. But they don't know all that they're saying. And they haven't learned that because we've ever said that to them. But we treat it as one of the most serious infractions. You, listen, you do not know what you just said. There's almost nothing worse you could say to mommy or daddy than I, I, I hate you. But maybe even worse than that is I wish you didn't exist. Or, I wish you were completely different than the way you are. My wife and I just celebrated our anniversary last week. Uh, we, we got outside the house away from the kids for three hours. That's about the, <laughs> the best we could, we could do for our 22nd anniversary. And I've learned with my wife that, you know, sh she's not... When I was younger and, you know, and we got married when I was in seminary and I was, you know, thinking sort of like a seminary student or Bible study leader and I would ask her questions like, what are three things you'd like to, we could do to improve our marriage? Now, maybe that goes well in your marriage. God bless you. It doesn't in mine because my wife hears, what are the three things you don't like about our marriage? So I joked her. I said, we've been married 22 years. Maybe we could just share 22 ways that each of us could improve as a husband or wife. 
She laughed and said, I'm going to need some time to think about that. And I laughed and I said, well, I brought a list. <laughs> I really didn't. But what if I had? And I went on 22 ways I wish you were different. I wish you were like this and this and this. Well, of course, we're sinners and all of us could be different in some good ways. But it would be hurtful. It would be uh, nigh unto hateful. We'd be saying, uh, I love you, but I wish you were completely different. That's what God's people are doing. Wish you were a different God. Oh, I love you, Yahweh. I just wish you were completely different than the sort of God that you are. Sin rejects God himself. And though they may be a whirlwind of worship, so-called, it's not any worship that God is pleased with. One commentator puts it this way, love may cover a multitude of sins, religious activity does not. And in particular, they preferred idolatry, just like you and I prefer idolatry, because idolatry is always easier. Here's how Sproul puts it. The cow gave no law, demanded no obedience, it had no wrath, no justice, no holiness to be feared. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. It, but at least it could not intrude on their fun and call them to judgment. This was a religion designed by men, practiced by men, and ultimately useless for men. Wow, he put his finger right on it. And you all can think if that describes any religious activity in your beautiful country here. An idolatrous religion. A God just the way we like him. No wrath, no justice, no holiness, nothing to be feared. A God who will not intrude upon our fun. A God who can sit there and we can offer some nominal religious obeisance to and he will let us go about and live our lives and rise up and have our fun just the way we want it. That's the God for me. Well, you know what? That's been the God that every unregenerate person has wanted throughout history. And that's what God's people wanted here. Sin was not only disobedience to God, it rejected the character of God. Number three, sin suppresses the truth of God. The New Testament understands this episode as a sad picture of that terrible exchange. Acts 7, 39 through 41. There in the preaching in Acts, it references again this episode. They rejoiced in the work of their hands. It's given as a picture in the preaching of the gospel as the very quintessence of what is wrong with pagan worship. Pagan worship rejoices in the work of human hands. Think about what Paul says in Romans 1, exchanging the truth for a lie, the glory of the immortal God for images of animals and people and creeping things. Our temptation, isn't it, is always to live by sight, not by faith. Because... We can sympathize a bit. The only person that they knew to really trust was Moses. There may have been as many as two million Israelites at this point. That's even big for an American megachurch. Two million of them. And they didn't all know Moses, but they had heard of him or they had seen him as they crossed the Red Sea. And now they don't know what's, what's gone where, where, where is he gone? He's up on the mountain, again on the mountain. So they barely knew Moses. They didn't all have a personal conversation with him. And now they can't see him. You can understand something of the attraction of the golden calf. They could see it. They knew it was valuable. It was made with the gold from their own rings and earrings and trinkets. They could touch it. They could bow down to it. It took their skill to craft it. And they were like everyone else. Remember, they have come out of 400 years of bondage in Egypt. For 400 years of their collective religious national memory was that's how you do religion. 
So that's what they had seen. Probably every day as they were slaves in Egypt. Saw in the distance the, the Sphinx or the pyramids as tombs to the great pharaohs or saw different pictures and statues and it just reinforced them. That's what religion is like. That's the challenge in any godless culture, any worldly system. It just seems normal. This is the way we do it. This is the way we do it. A calf, a bull. The emphasis here is on true worship. That's what we have in 25 through 31. And the contrast is so jarring. Chapter 32 is this idolatrous false worship, suppressing what God has revealed to them, not just in general revelation, but here in special revelation. They come foolishly in verse 5. Aaron makes a proclamation. He's built an altar. Tomorrow shall be a feast. And they bring their burnt offerings, verse 6, their peace offerings. Aaron's thinking, we can blend this together. We can make this work. A little bit of syncretism. We'll offer sacrifices. They were commanding Aaron what to do, verse 1, instead of receiving, speaking, listening. Now, if uh, I don't know how you take this back to your own churches, because you're the minister, but it is often the case. The, the people like to tell God's messengers what to do and aren't so eager to hear what God's messengers have to say to them. And you need to know when you need to listen and when you need to, you know, Spurgeon has that wonderful line about the, the deaf ear and the blind eye in lectures to my students, where it says there's sometimes with certain people, as they talk, you, you have to turn and say, speak into this ear, because it's your deaf ear. <laughs> I mean, look in your blind eye. Not because we're careless, but because we've learned that these people do not have the things of Christ at heart. Notice also the, the image here. The... the the word, as it's translated in English, is very interesting. You see at the very beginning, verse 1, they say, Up! Up! Make us gods. And then later, they take off their rings, and they make it, and they receive gold from their hands, verse 4, and they, these are your gods who brought you up out of the, the land of Egypt. And then even verse 6, they, they rose up. Now, it's, it's all different connotations, but it just knows up, up, up. And we'll come tomorrow, see what verse 7 says, the very first thing the Lord said to Moses, go, go down. And I do think it does get at the essence of true and false worship. That, that true worship is always God coming down to us, God's word coming down to us, God descending to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God tells us. Man-made worship is always, we can get up to God. We can go up there. We can figure this out. You think of the Tower of Babel. They built the tower up to God. And I think it really a bit of irony and a bit of humor there in Genesis where it says God had to go down. They were so Im impressed, patting themselves on the back. We built the biggest tower in the world. This is amazing. And then God has to go down. Did you look to the angels? Did they build a tower? I can't. Can you get the binoculars? I can't see the tower down there. Wasn't that impressive? Rebellious humans, up, up, up. True worship, down, down, down. Sin suppresses the truth of God. Number four, we're almost done. Sin squanders the blessings of God. Sin squanders the blessings of God. They should have been enjoying the fruit of their new covenant relationship with God. You go back in Exodus chapter 24, which is, you, you can see the title in the ESV, the covenant confirmed. The blood had hardly dried on that covenant before God's people were violating their own covenant obligations. We read in chapter 24, verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's how covenants work in the Old Testament. 
That's how covenants work in the Bible. There's stipulations. They say, yes, we will do it. Verse 7 in chapter 24, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. <sighs> High fives, fist bumps. Yes, we're doing it. God's people, the covenant will be obedient. The blood had heartily dried on that. Twice in the book of Exodus, we see God's people collectively eating and drinking in celebration together. Only twice where they gather for a collective feast. 24 and 32. 24, the establishment of the covenant. Chapter 32, the absolute shattering of the covenant. Exodus 24, 11, they beheld God, they ate and drank. Beheld God. We, we, we beheld him. We saw the God who is invisible. We beheld God, ate and drank. Do you notice what it says in 32 verse 6? The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. It's a mirror image. Establishing the covenant, shattering the covenant. How quickly they have fallen. Like having an affair on your honeymoon. That's what this is. They're repeating the same sad pattern we've seen in the first two books of the Bible. There's a covenant with Adam. In Genesis, Hosea uses that language. It's a covenant with Adam. In Genesis 2, there's a fall in Genesis 3. There's a covenant with Noah in 7, 8, 9. And then what happens immediately after that covenant with Noah? Another fall. He's sinning, nakedness, drunkenness. There's a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. Genesis 16, he's doing things his way. Sex with Hagar. Every time there's a new covenant, a new covenant administration, very next thing, failure. One of the lessons we're to connect to the new covenant is all along the way, God's people, we need a covenant where the one who, who establishes the covenant will not fail. Adam failed, Noah failed, Abraham failed, Moses and the people failed. We need a covenant keeper whose very next breath will not be covenant failure. Now, we, we can look back at all of these failures and say, wow, people were so dumb. <laughs> and that's right. One of my, I, I, maybe I'll make a bumper sticker of this. It's one of, one of my little sayings that has helped me many times in my own life and make sense of issues in the church. Feel free to steal it. Sin makes us stupid. You ever wonder why you look at someone who's thrown away a, a lifetime of faithfulness for 15 minutes of pleasure? Sin makes us stupid. Stupid. You, you, you look at people and you say, why, why, why can't you see just from sheer survival that you are making one bad decision after another because sin makes us stupid? We're given the example of the golden calf, at least in part, so that we might shudder at their folly and not make the same mistake they did, that we would say, oh, Lord, may we not squander those blessings. You know, privilege is a big word. You're privileged. Supposedly a thing we hear about a lot in the States at least. White privilege and lots of privilege. Uh, I'm not so into how the word is used, but, but there's a very good use of the word. Because privilege is a real thing. But it doesn't just work on racial lines or socioeconomic lines. But it works on spiritual lines. If you were born into a Christian family, if you have a heritage of Christian faithfulness, if you have the Bible in a language that you can understand, your heart language, if we have all of these good books that you can get, an embarrassment of riches, if you have freedom to worship God, if you have churches upon churches, what privilege. And I'm an outsider here, so I won't tell you, but... 
I imagine many of you would, would say that Scotland has squandered those privileges. And I can tell you that America is fast along the path of squandering her many blessings and squandering her privileges. Well, you may not be able to stop what your country does, but you can surely cry out to God and say, whatever this nation may do, not my family, Lord, not my congregation, Lord, may we not in my heart, Lord, may we not squander the blessings that you have given to us. Sin squanders the blessings of God, and finally, sin forgets the goodness of God. This episode of the golden calf is recounted by the psalmist in Psalm 106. And just notice the language that the psalmist uses. You can turn there or just listen as I read. This is Psalm 106, verse 6. Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. They rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. You saved them for his name's sake, or yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, it became dry, and led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them. Verse 11, the waters covered their adversaries, not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. But, verse 13, they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. They had a wanton craving in the wilderness, put God to test in the desert. And he gave them what they asked. But sent a wasting disease among them. Verse 19, they made a calf in Horeb, worshipped a metal image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome deeds by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said he would destroy them. Over and over, we read in these verses, they did not remember. They forgot. Being a Christian is nothing less than knowing what to remember and what to forget. I have removed your transgressions from you as far as the east is from the west. God forgetting our sins. God remembering his covenant. And so we must learn what to remember and what to forget. Forgetting the past. Forgetting our old way of life and yet always remembering what God has done. Do you see at the heart of their sin is they had forgotten. Where did the gold come from, from the golden calf? Their rings, now this one's actually platinum, and, but you got gold rings, gold trinkets. You know your Bible. Where did they get that gold? Egypt, they, they plundered the Egyptians. It wasn't but weeks or months ago. They should have, as, as they took off the ring, it should have been a reminder to them. We had nothing. We were slaves. Why do we have gold in our ears and gold on our bracelet, on our wrists and gold on our fingers? Because God saved us. Because God redeemed us. This gold that we have is from God and they forgot his goodness. He said, make it in to a calf. Sin is always an act of spiritual amnesia. We don't know what it's like to live in a new way. There's a movie that's on, it, 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 it's not an exaggeration to say, it's on some channel in the United States every single day. And I'm not necessarily commending you go see it unless you see the TV version, which is all I've seen. It's probably got some language, I think. But it's Shawshank Redemption. Okay, it's a very good story. Uh, it's a prison, so it's got some, some rough stuff in there. Again, TV version. Uh, just to spoil one part of it, but you know, you've had 30 years or something. So. <laughs> but one of the old men and 
a very kindly old man who's in the prison and he's eventually paroled and released and they put him in this kind of halfway house. It, it's set in the 1920s or no, 30s. Maybe. And the warden, of course, they make to be a religious hypocrite. So, But they, they, they send the man out and he goes to this the, the apartment where they go and he's free. And you know the story, it ends very sadly for him. He, he, he kills himself. He, he hangs himself. He, he can't get used to life on the outside. He's only known life in prison, and that life made sense to him. It was, it was bondage, but it made sense, and he, he knew how it worked, and he knew what it was, and he could never get used to a life of freedom. And so it is with some Christians. If only I could be back in bondage. If only I could be back in slavery, and everything looks better in the rearview mirror. Sin is spiritual amnesia, forgetting what God has given us, forgetting his gifts, forgetting his, his goodness. That's the audacity, the ugliness, the sinfulness of sin. Now we'll have much more to see in the next two days and see what God does, because thankfully he doesn't leave them there. This is, this is a turning point, because we should wonder at the end of verse 6, if you were just reading this story for the first time and you closed the page and it said to be continued, you should be left wondering, what will happen? Is this the end of Israel? As soon as there was a beginning, there was an ending. You should be left wondering, will anyone intercede for them? Can there be atonement made for such sin? They've grumbled, they've complained, and now in their first act of nationwide rebellion, will this be the end? of God's people. And the good news is if we are willing to look and deal with the utter sinfulness of sin, and if there is a mediator who will intercede for us, and an atonement can be made for us, that no matter how great our sin, how comprehensive our rebellion, it does not need to be the end of us. And so we who have the privilege of being gospel ministers know the end of the story. That the Lamb of God proves to be much stronger than the golden calf of Egypt. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word instructing us, leading us, equipping us. And we pray that you would give to us in these days attentive hearts and heads. We've preached many sermons. We've listened to many sermons. Yet give us something, even just a bit here or there, that would spur us on to continue the course to keep us faithful. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.